Thank you, Rose. Um, uh, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, and thanks to Bob Shetterly for painting this extraordinary portrait. Um, I had some fun conversations with uh, Bob uh, as he was painting um, about uh, my father's skin tone. Uh, was it, was it kind of blue or was it kind of pink? Um, and these were, uh, most of the pictures that Carol and Jerry had given to him were black and white pictures from uh, quite a long time ago. And, and this is um, sort of Phil Berrigan, the elder. So in talking to him, I, I flashed on one of my favorite uh, things to do with my dad. Um, he was a house painter, you know, and at the end of the day, his uh, face would be covered in oil-based paint. Right, um, and so uh, when my particularly when my mom was in jail, it would fall to me to uh, take an old diaper and dip it in turpentine, and then rub his face really hard um, with this diaper. Right? Can you imagine, like, you know, all the all the chemicals, right? Um, but uh, and so I just um, you know just this very sort of intimate moment that I uh, shared with that I would do kind of often uh, that I shared with Bob. Um, I was like, I don't know if it was pink or blue, but it was pretty turpentined up, uh, you know, by the end. It, he wasn't much of a sunscreen kind of oil of Olay guy. Um, but, um, but I think uh, Bob's uh, portrait really captures my dad's um, depth, his wisdom, his humor. Um, when, I, when I looked at the final, though, I said, you know, you made his hair much too neat. And there's something... <laughs> Kennedy-esque about my dad's hair in this picture that um, in reality it was totally white and very thin and, and messy. He <laughs> cut it himself. Um, so, But what I really liked about being part of Bob's creative process was, um, was that right away, uh, you know, there's lots of quotes that could be easily associated with my father about, about nonviolence, about nuclear weapons, um, about um, even about simple living. Um, but, uh, but Bob uh, chose this quote, um, which I'll read for those of you who don't have really, really good eyesight and be able to see around the corners, um, that, uh, that kind of came out of his experience in prison. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, my parents uh, were married for, okay, yep, for a long time, <laughs> for many years, um, and they spent 11 of those uh, years of marriage between, you know, 73, they got married, and then my father died in 2002, so some math major in the audience could uh, do the math real quick, but they spent 11 years of that marriage separated by prison, right? My, uh, mother in prison uh, for some stretches of that, but more uh, that was uh, my father's time in prison. Um, so the quote that Bob chose um, is, I see little difference between the world inside the prison gates and the world outside. A million, million, a million, million prison walls can't protect us because the real dangers, militarism, greed, economic inequality, fascism, police brutality lie outside, not inside prison walls. Um, and I think that that's a, a quote that really could only have been um, distilled and sort of concretized um, inside prison. Um, and it is this odd uh, realization um, of a daughter um, about a father who was uh, perhaps fully alive and fully sort of connected to other people and uh, fully himself uh, when he was away from us, when he was away from his immediate family and was behind bars. Um, and uh, I thought a lot about how we as a family maintained a tight familial relationship, how we rode and visited and connected with one another um, while he was in, in prison and while my mother was in prison. Um, but this, um, this piece of it that he was kind of happiest or most fully realized um, uh, in prison is, is uncomfortable and a little sad uh, to me. Um, and also something I admire uh, there. Um, so, and it's a good time to talk about prisons, right? It's a good time to reflect on prisons, right? There are 2.4 million of us, 2.4 million 
Americans in prison right now, right? And uh, those of you who listen to Democracy Now! and sort of read alternative media know what most Americans who are sort of, you know, fixated on this, he said, she said, of our, of our presidential uh, epoch, <laughs> this long, exhausting uh, thing, right, that there's this in incredible prison strike going on in U.S. prisons right now, right, that 900,000 people in prison work, right, and they make, they make, bras for Victoria's Secret, and they run calls for AT&T, and they make all the crap that's for sale at Walmart, that which is not made in China, right? Um, and then they get paid pennies, right? And uh, that there are nonviolent, peaceful actions happening in at least 24 different states and have been uh, throughout the month of September. Uh, and that it was organized um, you know, to coincide with the 45th anniversary of the Attica uprising, right? Um, so hunger strikes, marches, work stoppages, um, at, at least at one point, 20,000 prisoners involved um, in this uh, throughout the country, demanding better working conditions, the right to unionize, rebelling against inadequate health care and solitary confinement, um, and all of this kind of happening, um, you know, far from the consciousness uh, of, of most Americans. Um, so that, that made me want to turn to some of the things that uh, my dad had written uh, while in prison and uh, his reflections on, on being a prisoner, um, on uh, you know, being this, identifying himself as a person of phenomenal privilege, right? Well-educated, you know, physically strong, you know, white Catholic American, a priest, a Roman Catholic priest, um, this person of privilege trying to, trying to take some of that off or peel some of those layers off and not, you know, not being able to fully do that, but uh, being most able to be in touch with other human beings um, uh, in prison. Um, so I turned to all these books, uh, which my mom gave me when, uh, when my dad died, uh, which I honestly don't read all that often or pick up all that often, um, and just wanted to share a couple of things. Uh, so this is a book that's no longer in print. It's, um, I think it was published in 1973, uh, Writings from Jail, Widen the Prison Gates, and it's sort of a diary um, of his time in prison, mostly around the Harrisburg conspiracy trial. Um, and in it, he writes about, um, so we'll see how I can, uh, you know, juggle the microphone and the, you know, this and all that, and, and then continue to gesticulate madly around. Um, and uh, waiting for trial at Harrisburg, right, and most people here would know what Harrisburg was. It was this conspiracy uh, trial that my dad and Uncle Dan and uh, my mom and Ekbal Ahmed and uh, a number of other people were, uh, brought up on these trumped up charges of conspiring to kidnap Henry Kissinger, who was at that, that time the Secretary of State, um, and put uh, bombs in the heating ducts of, of uh, Washington, D.C., right? And these were just um, these ridiculous uh, charges, mostly, uh, you know, founded from uh, people infiltrating uh, the groups that were having just kind of conversations uh, late at night and ultimately concluding that while, well, you know, that would be a dramatic action that there was no way to kind of conduct these things nonviolently, right? There was no way to ensure that nobody would be heard in the process and sort of casting that idea aside. Um, one of the other sort of uh, big things about Harrisburg is that in the course of the Harrisburg trial, uh, the fact that my mother and father had married one another secretly um, uh, came out in open court, right? Their secret was exposed in open court. Right, um, so, but, uh, but in this, uh, dad is in prison, um, and uh, he and another prisoner, Ted Glick, um, who uh, maybe some of you know, he's a, a climate change activist, a very gifted guy, um, uh, they decide to go on a hunger strike, and, um, and they are transferred to, a, like a, to another prison uh, and put in a medical kind of facility for a while, and then uh, transferred back. Um, and so they come back at the end of September and the prison strike is over, the hunger strike is over, um, and it's uh, created this new uh, kind of 
this new excitement and enthusiasm and sort of esprit de corps, you know, um, uh, throughout the prison. So, so Dad writes, a new month. New months are greeted, are always greeted with anticipation and relish, as though they constitute a rare achievement in endurance. They say one doesn't count time when doing good time, but compromise and venerates even the best of principles. We have a memorial plan for tomorrow dedicated to the dead in Vietnam of San Quentin and Attica prisons. The administration, apprehensive of similar trouble here, has tolerated an inmate commi committee composed of delegates from the black, Spanish-speaking, and white communities. Meetings with officials commenced on Wednesday. Slow, painful, exasperating work. What with the deviousness of our jailers and the inexperience of our prisoners. But a few gains begin to register. The men hang in persistently and nonviolently. Support grows, interest widens, and new hope takes root. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Um, our jailers would have both us and the public believe that change will spring magically from negotiations. But the firepower they pack displays their hypocrisy. Here, as in Indochina, the fact is that they're saying, we have the guns. What do you have? We have nothing but gesture. A few hundred demonstrators outside the walls, a few hundred of us inside, have nothing but our gesture which we hope is more human and therefore more powerful than picking up a gun against one's brothers. Memorial services begin in the auditorium with the chairman of the prisoner committee offering some remarks. One has to understand the context of these remarks. He is memorializing the dead of Vietnam, of San Quentin and Attica, and a lot of political prisoners under the iron fist of Uncle Sam. Hundreds of people, maybe thousands, many from far away have arrived to support us, right, outside the prison walls. Yet he begins by rejecting any political connotation in what we're doing, asserting that it is unconnected with any event outside. I try to make allowance. He is a well-paid lawyer from New York City who has nonetheless worked hard and selflessly for the memorial program. It is not an auspicious beginning. We have agreed that I should keep out of it, Dan, however, rescues the proceedings with a few words of St. Paul's. When I was a child, my speech, feelings, and thinking were all those of a child. And now that I am a man, I have no more use for childish ways. He tells of a custom unknown, not unknown in the villages of contemporary India, whereby unwanted children are imprisoned in earthen jars with holes cut in the bottom for defecation in which they grow crippled and stunted and are freed only when physical damage is irreparable. Then they can be exploited as beggars. So do most Americans, so do most Americans relate to power as spiritual beggars who cannot imagine themselves apart from the state handout. But the sign of a man is straightening his limbs by reaching out to a brother, breaking his own jar, so to speak. The proceedings get better. Blacks read their poetry to the accompaniment of drums. Excellent. I go to a visit and return to a slightly different spirit. These men, so many of them cheap grafters, who have never received a single worthwhile thing from community or achieved anything by a profession of moral or political ambition, have a new sense of themselves. So the day is a beginning, imperfect and schoolboyish, and quite beyond expectation. What I love about that passage is, um, is that you know he has this, uh, you know that nothing is ever like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever, right? Like that there's always sort of this piece of, you know, like this is just beginning, this is just starting, and and I think that that carried throughout that um, everything he did in in in. in despite the fact that he kind of gave it his all all the time, um, was always, he was always thinking uh, that it could be better, um, that it could be better, that he could have done better. Um, and I wanted to uh, kind of read a little bit from the same basic time period, uh, but from uh, Dan's perspective, uh, joining Phil at Danbury. Um, prison in Connecticut. 
and kind of how they uh, turned uh, the um, turned the prison into a school. Um, and what's kind of funny about this, uh, in a couple of pages before, Dan writes about how, um, you know, when you go into jail, you need, when you go into prison, you need to have a job, right? But they're very careful in not letting people have jobs within their professions, right? So Dan Berrigan, priest, poet, um, becomes the denti dentist's assistant, right? And he's mopping the floor and sort of prepping uh, guys for just these, um, these awful dental procedures, right? These just kind of like teeth pulling, uh, torturous uh, extractions. Um, and uh, my dad would always uh, try and get um, jobs in jail in the barber shop. He always wanted to uh, sweep in the barber shop. Um, and then, uh, what you, for one reason, you know, he always had a nice haircut if he was working in the barber shop. And then, uh, then he had lots of time to just kind of be in the library and be reading and writing. Um, but the barber shop also gave him a chance to connect with other people, right? People coming through the barber shop and getting their haircut, kind of this moment of like real kind of connection to other people. Nobody ever would have wanted him to cut their hair though. He would have given them really, really bad haircuts. I have had lots of really bad haircuts from my dad. Um, so, right. I'm sorry. Not recently. Yeah. Okay, all done. Good job. Um, but so, uh, so Dan, yeah, you know, is, is working in the dentist's office. Um, but uh, so he writes, uh, shortly after my arrival in Danbury, Philip was transferred from Lewisburg, a gesture, perhaps of mitigation. In Danbury, Phil and I uh, presented our keepers with a conundrum of substance. We were priests. We were also convicted felons and for the present, federal prisoners. A law stated that felons were prohibited while in prison from exercising their profession. Lawyers could not lawyer, doctors could not doctor, teachers could not teach. But here was a nifty dilemma. What should priests not do, which they normally did? <laughs> ah, we have it. Priests offer the mass. Therefore, these priests, while in custody, shall be forbidden to offer mass. It was all quite simple. And ironically and beautifully, it left Philip and me a very continent of territory in which to explore. Ride rapids, go spelunking, try the Himalayan face cross Gobi deserts, in some discover work to the benefit of the prisoners. Priests who were prisoners could not offer mass for other prisoners. Very well, we would seek another opening. Priests, according to law, were not teachers, and therefore we would become teachers. We would organize classes, encourage reading, invite discussion. Indeed, we had wide access to friends in publishing houses in New York and elsewhere, and they to vast quantities of books. The books poured in a very Niagara. Word got around. After much dickering and puzzlement as to what we might be up to, the authorities assigned a room for our easy evening assemblies. The prisoners began reading, serious stuff, many for the first time. In subsequent weeks, we read and chewed into digestible pieces the following. Sections of the Bible, Greek tragedies, a few substantial novels, including Gulliver's Travels, Marx, modern poetry, feminist works. Prisoners came and went. They entered prison and left for other prisoners, prisons for release. We were a large island in an archipelago of misery, in a sea whose tides moved in and out aimlessly, witlessly, bearing its wreckage to and fro. Still, these little, little colonies of survivors, books in hand, were a sign of sorts. One need not be desperate or resigned or cynical or bored, as the prison decreed. And other prisoners could take soundings from us. They could hear, read, utter, ponder a word that went beyond the vengeful, vengeful the trivial, the wasted and wanted, the wasted and wanton and boastful and brutal the common coinage of the prison yard, the cells, the dreary human warehouse, its defeats and discards. <clears throat> so in their course went the days and months, and we encountered stupendous characters. We came on reasons for hilarity and tears, 
were rebuffed and remanded and summoned to petty judgment by petty minds. They declared from time to time suspicion that seditious goings-on were threatening the good order of Bedlam. But why care as long as the good work went on? Um, and this was sort of my view of prison as a, as a young person, was uh, this place where my father was a teacher um, and where he kind of gathered groups of, of men for Bible study and for discussion. Um, and I love that image. That was sort of a comforting uh, image. Uh, you know, other people's fathers went off to work and, um, or went off to war, and, uh, and my dad uh, went off to prison and, uh, and came back, honestly, most of the time, no worse for the wear, you know, except in, uh, you know, missing us. Um, I was thinking, too, of some of my uh, memories of, of prison visiting rooms, you know, uh, and some of you who have been in prisons know this, and those of you who do prison ministry know this, too, right, that they're, they're really set up to uh, be just about as awful and um, inhuman as, as humanly possible. They're designed in that way, right? Uh, so many times there's, uh, in some places, particularly short-term places, there's plexiglass, and you talk on a telephone, uh, to your uh, loved one through sort of this kind of filmy, dirty, uh, uh, grimy, scratched up class. Um, when we were in college, uh, we would go and visit my dad in Lorton, uh, Maryland. It was actually a youth facility uh, where everybody called him Pops, uh, which we were never allowed to call him, in part, I think, because that's what everybody called him in prison was Pops. And um, in this place, so most of the kids were, I mean, most of the prisoners were kids, you know, were teenagers. Um, and uh, in this prison, there wasn't uh, plexiglass, um, but there was this um, divider, uh, maybe about this high, about this high. And um, you sat against it. It was just kind of a straight thing. You had to kind of sit sideways, and you couldn't touch it, right? You couldn't lean on it. And so you, it was high enough, it was, it was designed perfectly to make it impossible to sort of maintain eye contact and sort of square body to body connection. You could um, hug and kiss at the beginning um, and at the end, uh, but you couldn't rest your arm on the top of this and you couldn't hold hands. Um, and uh, there was a man whose job it was to watch this chaotic, filled room of people connecting with their, you know, mostly because this was a, 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 a young person's prison, a juvenile prison. I don't know why my dad was there. But um, uh, mostly, you know, mothers and fathers visiting their sons, right? And, um, and to not be able to put your arm on this very convenient <laughs> armrest to be able to be kind of in close physical proximity to have to turn your body. Anyway, I just uh, remember that vividly. Remember going, uh, when I graduated from college, my father was in um, a, a local jail. He had been there for months, but it was uh, designed as a very short-term uh, facility up in Cumberland County, Maine. And we left graduation uh, from Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts and drove straight up uh, to get there in time for evening visiting. Um, and there was this very faithful community of people who visited uh, my father and uh, the other uh, men who were there um, every single day. And uh, we had told them that, they were, that we were coming uh, so that they wouldn't come and visit, but they had all lined up uh, just in case um, uh, we didn't make it or something. And it was this awkward kind of thing of, um, you know, kind of jumping to the front of the line uh, in front of all these people who were so faithful. So, uh, and these visits over the years uh, developed sort of a, um, well, there was sort of a script, right? You want to get as much as you can in in a relatively short period of time and kind of against all of these um, difficulties that are, that are kind of put in your way. Um, so, we would sort of start and we would report, right? Like we would kind of like be ready with a report on how things were going. And I would go and then my brother would go and then my sister would go and then my mom would go. 
And then he would just kind of take it all in. And then there was like a Q&A period where he would ask us questions back. And then he would sort of report on him. But it was always, um, it was uh, never like, gosh, this place sucks. The food is so bad. The people, it's so loud. You know, like all of the kind of things which you could legitimately complain about. Um, he would talk about his relationships with the other with the other people um, and how all of that was going um, and who he was hopeful about, right? Who he was connecting with in the prison, who he was particularly hopeful about. This, this particular person really is loving Bible study and responding so um, deeply uh, to the gospel stories and he would share about that. Um, and then ask my mom lots of questions. They would kind of then have like a business meeting about the community. And we would just sort of like sit there and try and appreciate it. Um, when, uh, when September 11th happened, um, my dad was in prison in Ohio. Um, and uh, and he, uh, he disappeared. Um, he was put into uh, he was put into solitary confinement, right? You all remember September 11th, those of who. And now I realize that some people are too young to remember September 11th, which is this funny sort of middle-aged uh, thing for me. I was trying to explain to my kids what a VCR was recently. I'm just like, <laughs> never mind. I'm not. Don't even worry about it. Never mind. Um, 42. Yeah, oh, thanks. Me. Yeah, 42. Yeah, <laughs> hold it on. Um, but, uh, but so, so, you know, by 11 o'clock that morning, right, uh, the prison system in Ohio had acted and had kind of pulled my dad out and put him into solitary confinement. And uh, the only reason my mom uh, figured this out is that they wrote every day. So there was always, you know, a letter came every single day uh, from my dad. Um, but then for a number of days, no letters came. And, uh, and so she started making calls and, and got nowhere and finally got um, in touch with our, um, our senator, Barbara Mikulski. Um, and Barbara Mikulski started making calls and then it turned out he, yes, he was in the specialized housing unit, the SHU, um, and had been since uh, the morning of September 11th. We found out later, and um, Anne-Marie Cusack has written um, extensively about this in the Progressive magazine, that um, political prisoners all throughout you know, the US prison system on September 11th were isolated and were pulled um, out of general population and put into um, segregation. And um, luckily, each one of those people, right, um, Suniati Ocholi and you know, uh, Puerto Rican independence uh, fighters who are in prison, all, all of these different people, each one of them has a network around them much like my dad had a network around them, and all of them were, um, you know, through the advocacy of the people on the outside, able to get out um, of, of segregation uh, within 10 days or, or two weeks, right? But no letters, no, uh, no connection uh, with other people during that time. Um, and, uh, and I have, um, over the years, thought a lot about this, right? You know, I was... In New York City on September 11th, I was, you know, kind of like many other people trying to figure out what had happened, like what's going on, what does this mean, what, what are the consequences of this, what, what does this mean in my immediate, like how am I going to get home today kind of life. Um, but, uh, but the prison system wasn't asking any of those questions. They kind of knew exactly what to do. Um, and uh, much like the Bush administration kind of put into motion all of these plans that had sort of been um, on the shelf, right? Um, the, the pretext to invade Afghanistan and to invade Iraq. Um, the, the Bureau of Prisons had its own sort of, um, its own sort of wish list uh, that it took advantage of September 11th uh, to put into place. Um, so uh, I, um, I'm juggling too many papers. I, I wanna read the, this is a, a lovely book um, that came out uh, right after Dan Berrigan died. Um, the end of April, uh, May 1st, uh, this book was published by Orbis, and it's uh, the letters between Dan and Phil, 
uh, going back to when uh, Dan left home as a, as a young Jesuit novice, as a 19-year-old uh, young man, and, and started writing back to the one brother who is still uh, at home, uh, his brother Phil, um, who he loved very much. And, um, and basically, this book is sort of like a, a compendium of, so, you know, from, from the age of 19 to the age of 79, uh, or 17 for my dad and, and 79 when he died, um, of essentially love letters back and forth, almost daily love letters between uh, my uncle and my father. And uh, in some ways, uh, nothing happened until in either of these extraordinary lives until they had uh, taken a couple minutes and written to one another and to uh, their brother Jerry as well about what they were experiencing. So on September 13th, uh, which was a Thursday of 2011, um, my dad finally is able to get a piece of paper and a pencil. Um, and this letter didn't go out for many weeks, but he wrote it on that day. Dearest brother, and pencil writing from solitary, third day, following that enormous tragedy on September 11th, I'm under investigation again. I bleed for the thousands of victims. Please call here and ask what investigation and when. For all I know, the pharaohs are going into knee jerk and rounding up the naysayers. Remember the Japanese during World War II? Don't worry, I'm okay. Came here without my glasses and have been agitating to get them like punching a wall of marshmallows. Praying for the victims and the victimizers. Love you much, many thanks. Christ's peace, Phil. Um, and uh, it was be about, uh, he would get out of jail for the last time in uh, December of 2001, um, and then uh, died in 2002, December of 2002. Um, and, uh, and so, that was, uh, that was sort of his, his last uh, period in prison. And uh, when he came out uh, for that last time, and we didn't, I mean, I guess we didn't really know it was the last time, although many of us hoped, again, that it was the last time, um, uh, a lot of his friends uh, welcomed, welcomed him back, hey, welcome back to minimum security, was the, the line I, uh, I saw a lot, of, um, a lot of particularly peace activist men, hey, hey, Phil, Welcome back to minimum security. Um, and I kind of like that, right? It kind of goes back to this um, quote uh, that Bob Shetterly pulled out. Um, but it also was just like kind of this macho, you know, this macho thing. I was like, oh, God. yeah, he's heard it before, man. Yeah, you're not, uh, anyway, you're not being very unique right now. Um, I thought I would end, I'm not paying attention to the, oh, yeah, there it is. I've been talking for a long time. Um, I thought I would end uh, just uh, with a, a little bit uh, from, uh, this, um, from this, my, from my book, uh, uh, It Runs in the Family, which came out in 20, uh, 2015 and is sort of um, half uh, uh, essays and memories uh, of uh, growing up at Jonah House and growing up with uh, Liz and Phil and half sort of my own uh, sort of ham-fisted efforts at, um, at peacemaking and, and parenting and um, trying to raise, um, trying to raise uh, good children who care about, um, care about the world. Um, so uh, one of the issues that has um, really preoccupied me over the last number of years has been, uh, has been Guantanamo, right? And uh, the internment of, of Muslim and Arab men at, uh, at Guantanamo. And um, it's a, I helped to start an organization called Witness Against Torture, which Ed and others have really um, supported and been a part of. Uh, we went to Cuba in 2005 and, and again in uh, 2015, uh, trying to get to the prison. Um, and uh, at some point I was asked sort of why, like why this issue amongst like all issues that are kind of out there and um, everything that uh, I could be spending my time doing, well, like why is this the thing? And it comes back to my experience of having a father um, in prison, right? Um, so uh, with your indulgence, I'll sort of finish by um, reading uh, just a little bit of this. There are so many issues, so many injustices, so many transgressions that tug at the heartstrings and the conscience and only so much time only so much energy, and I'm haunted 
by the family shattered by indefinite detention. I'm undone by the fact that they suffer for our security. And I do what I can because I cannot sit idly by while children are kept from their fathers. Even before I really understood time, I always knew that my mom and dad would come home from jail. It was not forever. It was not endless. Six months, 18 months, two years, even the longest sentence had a come home date. And there was always someone in the community who could figure out what an 18 month federal sentence actually meant. Time off for good behavior, the newest sentencing guidelines that made every third Friday count for two and a quarter days, whatever. There was always someone who could say, look at it this way, 18 months sounds like a really long time, but your dad will be home before next Easter. And they were right, he was always coming home, and so was mom. But Ferris and Johanna and Michael's father has not come home. Shakar Amr is originally from Saudi Arabia, but he's lived in the United Kingdom since 1966, where he's a legal resident married to a British citizen. Shakar and his family were in Afghanistan in 2001 doing charity work when he was seized by Afghan bounty hunters and turned over to US forces. He recalled his relief at ending up in American hands after being held and mistreated by various Afghan groups. But that relief was short-lived. He was brought to Guantanamo in February of 2002 and tortured repeatedly, singled out as a ringleader and subjected to gross abuses. Shakar Amr has been cleared for release since June of 2007 and the Bush and Obama administrations agree that he's not a terrorist, that he poses no threat to the United States or, it interests, or its interests, and yet he continues to languish at the prison. Um, and he was finally released in November of uh, last year, November of 2015, um, after just extraordinary organizing uh, by uh, British citizens um, on his behalf. When I first started learning about Guantanamo, one of the things that really struck me was how letters in and out of the prison were read and censored. Lakhdar uh, Boumahinadine, an Algerian who spent more than seven years at Guantanamo, wrote an op-ed in uh, 2012 in the New York Times, and he wrote, during that time my daughters grew up without me. They were toddlers when I was imprisoned and were never allowed to visit or speak to me on the phone. Most of their letters were returned as undeliverable, and the few that I received were so thoroughly and thoughtlessly censored that their messages of love and support were lost. I still have so many letters from my dad, and when I miss him, all I need to do is open up a green box that sits on my desk and hold a small piece of him in my hand. Slips of yellow legal pad, usually just a quarter sheet, just about this big, his handwriting neat and legible with a spidery slant, his voice still so alive. I know that envelopes in and out of jails and prisons in the U.S. are subjected to search and could be read, but his letters were never altered. When I stay up too late working on a press release, when the last thing I want to do is brainstorm, brainstorm ideas for the next action, when I'm hungry and delirious on day two of a 10 or 12 day fast, when I spend the night on a hard and grubby floor of a police holding cell, when the handcuffs are too tight, when the orange jumpsuit is too unflattering or too hot or too cold or too stinky from the last person who wore it, when the last thing I want to do is go to another demonstration to close Guantanamo, I think about those 10 days our family spent working to get my dad out of the hole. I think about how precious that first letter after the long silence was. I think about how happy I was to hear his voice on the phone. And I think about how even when he was incom incommunicado, he was always coming home. And I want that for Ferris and Johanna and all the parents and children at Guantanamo. So uh, the question was, uh, so uh, sir, coming out of the experience of having a parent in prison, you know, so what am I thinking about as, as a mother now? And so, you know, am, am I going to do that? Am I not going to do that? What, um, I think I had, uh, I began to get an inkling of um, 
the cost of um, these actions. Um, when, after our father died, um, sort of accompanying my mom as my brother and sister got arrested, knowing that my sister was accompanying her as I was getting arrested, and sort of seeing uh, her struggle with us getting arrested. And uh, it being almost comical to me at the time, and this was before I, I was married or had children, but it was hilarious to me that she was worried about us. I mean, it was also very sweet, but it was, there was something kind of funny about it, right? Um, this is a woman who, uh, at the White House one time, you know, the, the police, um, you know, grabbed her arm and, you know, kind of took that banner out of her hand and she, she put it in her mouth. And uh, as the cops, like, you know, handcuffed her, right? And she held onto it with her mouth until they pulled it out, you know? And uh, this is a fierce woman, right? And um, my sister did this action. Um, uh, my sister's kind of hardcore, and she uh, climbed uh, the Trans America building in Los Angeles at this banner drop action, um, uh, you know, maybe like eight years ago. And uh, she's hanging off the side of this building, you know, getting kind of like, you know, buffeted by the wind and this enormous building uh, against uh, Ford's use of fossil fuels. And, um, and uh, my mom, I happened to be in Baltimore, I was living in New York at the time, and uh, my mom is calling the organizer, a young woman named Hillary, as I recall. <laughs> Hello, Hillary. How's everything going out there? Um, and uh, like on the hour, you know, for these updates. And uh, Kate finally, you know, gets, you know, down, safely arrested, processed, you know, flies back to Baltimore, you know, all in the course of like a day and a half. Uh, she gets off the plane and my mom says, well, Hillary must have been so busy with everybody's parents, right, because they're all sort of young, you know, right out of college kind of uh, people, um, you know, uh, dealing with everybody's parents as she's, you know, dealing with press and police and all of this just different stuff. And, Mom said, oh no, mom, nobody else's mom was calling Hillary, just, just you. Um, and, uh, and mom was like, oh, no. did they not know? And Kate was like, right, they did not know that their kids were hanging from the side of a building. And I said, maybe, mom, maybe in the future you don't want to know either. And she said, no, I must know. Um, so, so it's a funny story, but it's the beginning of me being like, oh, right, like, this was hard for us as kids, right? But we, kind of as kids, were sort of told to, like, our part of the work is to kind of go with this, right? And then to see that kind of from a different angle as a, as a young adult, as my mom, you know, struggles to do this now alone, right? Like, without my dad is sort of this, like, it's going to be okay, you know? Um, and then... Uh, and then honestly, since I've had children, I've been arrested like once, right? And I, I went to Cuba in, in, the, in the fall and, um, or Thanksgiving of last year um, when I was gone for almost two weeks. Um, and we fasted and we, we, we put ourselves in a position where we could have been um, apprehended by the Cuban police or Cuban government, um, but, uh, but we weren't, and then came back, and there was no consequence on the American side because there's been, a, you know, because of the warming of relations between our two countries. Um, but I have, I think I have a really good sense of how hard, you know, it's hard to get arrested, but it's a lot harder to, to be the people who are sort of holding it together on the other end. And, um, you know, like if my, my conscience sort of, demanded that of me, you know, my husband would like, he'd kind of be all for it. He was really pushing me to go to Cuba and, and do this. He also had this um, uh, ulterior motive, which was weaning our uh, year and a half, uh, year and a half year old daughter at the time. He's like, go, go and I'll wean her and she'll come back and she'll never want to nurse again. And I was like, okay, all right, that sounds good. Um, but, uh, but I think, you know, I think going to jail was easier for my father than like what we did, you know, for the abolition of nuclear weapons, right? That he, um, he had it easier and he, I think he knew that too, um, that my mom had the harder job when she was home with us, that the community that took care of us had the harder job um, and that we as 
three-year-olds and five-year-olds and 11-year-olds and 17-year-olds that we had the harder job um, and that his conscience uh, demanded a lot of us. Um, and he was confident that like we could do that um, and, and we could. Um, and uh, that toughness is, you know, in my siblings and I, um, you know, as a, as a result of that. Um, but uh, he never asked us, you know, neither of our parents ever asked us. Um, and I think that's because they, they would have done it anyway. <laughs> you know, they would have done it anyway. And um, I do a lot of things that my kids don't want me to do, um, but I can't, I can't imagine that, right? I can't imagine that. And yet, you know, the times call for all sorts of things from us, right? And, um, and so I guess my answer right now is I'm open, you know, but I'm, I'm also not like, not throwing myself across any barricade at this particular juncture. Um, and that, that feels hard too, right? Like that feels like, what am I doing, you know? So, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, we're not alone. Um, and I uh, reflect a lot in the book about uh, the role of so many of those people, um, that community, the Jonah House community, the extended community um, on you know, filling in those gaps and making them feel like they weren't gaps. Um, so Ellen Grady, who I'm sure is known to many in this community, um, who now lives in Ithaca, her husband Peter DeMott, huge in, in that particular time period as, um, as people at Jonah House and, and then all of the Grady's, you know, and that's kind of when they really kind of became part of our family and uh, those relationships continue to this, to this day. And um, so, yeah, thank you for bringing that piece of it in because it's such an important piece. Uh, well, Ed wants to hear more about me and my uh, activist kind of trajectory. And, and I guess I can share briefly that, um, well, may, maybe sort of two things. One was um, that the first Gulf War started, um, you know, January 17, 1991, right? Um, and I was a junior in high school. And um, my entire high school, you know, a very diverse uh, place, uh, but a college um, preparatory uh, public high school in in Baltimore, you know, all the kids were sort of like reflexively against the war. Um, and, uh, but uh, nobody really knew like what to do about it or how to kind of relate to um, it. And, you know, the American Friends Service Committee was doing this uh, vigil every night, um, but that wasn't really kind of like a, an easy place to bring like a whole bunch of teenagers sort of fired up about, um, out, about like their war, right? And so I realized um, that uh, through the Jonah House community, through my relationships, that I had a lot of resources. And, um, and that, was, um, that was a lovely realization to have and to sort of come into my own as a junior in high school and you know, be getting kids on buses and you know, going down to Washington and sign parties and just this kind of nuts and bolts stuff um, and really um, facilitating a, a way for um, the people I went to school with uh, to, uh, to kind of make their own voices heard um, uh, was, uh, meant a lot to me, right? And was kind of this like, oh, right? There's value in all of this, whatever that I have, right? And I can kind of share it with other people. Um, when I moved to New York, I, uh, after college, I interned at The Nation magazine, which was um, uh, really, really, uh, lovely experience um, and I would uh, share these articles that I was working with uh, working on fact checking uh, with my dad and he would just be like oh, the nation really <laughs> like it's so secular um, I'd be like yeah right it is um, and uh, and then um, but I, I, I love seeing like how a mag like people kind of talking about all of these ideas. And um, uh, at the time, the Nation magazine was really fixated on Monica Lewinsky and kind of the, it was really kind of a boring time uh, for the Nation magazine. It's kind of, uh, but anyway, um, but then I was living in New York and the War Resisters League, uh, this secular uh, pacifist organization, um, you know, had his offices there. Um, and uh, Ralph DeGia, you know, I, here's Bayard Rustin here in the corner, 
looking over at dad, these two um, great people. So Bayard was, a, um, was dead by the time I was um, in New York City, but uh, um, was with the War Resisters League. And the lovely thing about being a part of the War Resisters League was that um, they, they thought Phil Berrigan was great, but they also had a lot of critique of plowshares and of, um, of sort of uh, symbolic disarmament and, um, you know, of going to prison. Uh, and, you know, like there was, a, there was sort of a conversation and I, I, could, I could just kind of be free to there and not need to like really represent all, all of that. Um, and uh, was attracted to war tax resistance and, all of that there and over the course of about a decade really learned a lot of the skills that you know came to bear in witness against torture around meeting facilitation and um, you know media work and all of that were skills that I, I built there um, and uh, I guess one of the things that I discovered in witness against torture and through like a, a funny kind of waking dream um, and a conversation that I had with my dad um, uh, a number of years after he was dead. Um, I, and maybe the easiest way is to just tell this story. I'm, I'm, I'm walking to the Supreme Court um, and I'm by myself and I'm fasting and I'm carrying like a whole bunch of signs and like a, a, a bag full of jumpsuits um, and I've, I'm carrying a sound system on this side. So I've kind of got like all this stuff and I'm late and I'm, you know, kind of rushing. And, uh, and my dad says to me, um, this is too busy. You got too much going on here. There are too many moving pieces. You, you got to keep it simple, Frida. And I said, <laughs> I said, dad, you know, not everybody can just go up the steps of the Pentagon with a, a baby bottle full of blood and throw blood on the Pentagon, right? Like, not everybody can do that. Kind of declaiming the entire way, you know, articulately. Like, we can't all do that. That's simple, uh, but we can't all do that. And, and he says, okay, yeah, I hear that. And I said, these are all pieces. These are all these moving pieces mean that a lot of people can participate in this action and uh, that there's a role for everybody, including the people who can't talk, you know, and kind of extemporaneously just sort of mouth off, um, and including the people who can't get arrested, um, including, you know, the people who are shy, who are just learning about these issues. Um, I have on my person all the pieces that can invite a lot of people to participate in this action. And, uh, and he said, oh, okay, well, good luck then, and hurry up, because they're waiting for you. And, um, and I realized that that, that was, and then I just like burst into tears, right, and, and like started running. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, but that has been the thing that I really want, have wanted to do, and um, have occasionally succeeded at, is um, through War Resisters League, through Witness Against Torture, through sort of other efforts that I've been a part of, really wanting to make room for like a lot of people to participate and be a part of things. Um, and um, to kind of dismantle a little bit the sort of the trope of the, the fearless leader, right? Which, you know, my dad um, didn't want to be like the fearless leader, but he was really well suited to it. And, you know, he was a former priest and, um, and a big guy and somebody who a lot of people look to. Um, and I saw him kind of struggle with that a, a lot and, and then kind of, you know, default to it because it's, it's easy. Um, and, uh, and so that is, that is something that I've really like worked on. Um, and uh, so a lot of moving pieces, a lot of complicated things, um, but, uh, but it seems like it's, it's worked and it's um, kind of really does come out of my experience um, and is sort of grounded in my desire for, for there to be room for everybody. So repeat myself there, but yeah, thanks Ed. Thank you. Yeah.